Hello and welcome to the video. In this video I will be looking at Belgium Dark Strong Ales and showing you a brew of one of mine. It is fair to say that I have a deep appreciation and affection for the Belgian brewing styles. My favourite of all of these is the Belgian Dark Strong Ale style. Examples of this style are packed full of flavours and are usually sipped like a fine cognac. There are many fantastic examples of this beer style from the commercial market. These beers are supplied by both the Trappist and regular breweries. One of my favourites is the Trappist Rochefort 10, and I did actually a clone brew of this not so long ago, which is available on this channel. I also find the Straffa Hendrik to really hit the spot, but today I'm not going to brew anything like a commercial beer. The recipe that I'm sharing with you today is my own concoction, and it's something that I've been working on passionately for quite some years. Uh, I've had a very good reception to it in the past from those that have tasted the uh, various reiterations of this, and I feel that uh, this is something that uh, everyone will enjoy as long as they like this particular beer style. My mission statement on this particular brew has always been to take the very best parts of the various different uh, commercial versions of this beer and put them all in together in one delightful package. So here's a quick look at the recipe for this brew. You will find a copy of this recipe in the YouTube video description and I've also saved it to the Grainfather Recipe Creator Cloud. You will note that there's a variety of different mash steps in this one. This is very characteristic of style. The recipe also has seven different types of grain and also the addition of candy sugar. Given time to condition, this brew will be very, very flavorful and complex. Being very much a malt forward beer rather than a hop forward beer, there's only a couple of different hop additions in this one. Yeast wise, I'm using Mangrove Jack's M31 Belgian Triple. This is actually my go-to yeast these days for these Trappist styles and I really enjoy the flavours that this punches out. Despite being just a 15 litre brew, I'm using the standard pipework for this one. So on with the brew now and it's time to mash in. As usual you can see here that I'm going with a fairly fine grain crush. So during the mashing in it's very very important to gradually introduce the grain and stir in between adding each part. It's certainly wise to never rush this process because this is the first part apart from your grain crush that will determine how good your efficiency is. As the amount of grain begins to accumulate make sure you stir the middle, the top and the bottom. When you've done all of this and you add your top plate, then push it all the way down to the grain and then just lift it up a tad. This will really improve your efficiency than any other method. Because I utilise a fairly fine grain crush, I actually add a sink strainer to the top and this will filter out any loose pieces. So as discussed, this is actually a strong beer and certainly when it comes to normal mashing we wouldn't normally do this but seeing as we were looking to extract as much sugar from the grain as possible here then what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to stop the mash at every step and give it a good stir up. In order to do this obviously we need to remove the top plate and I would recommend the use of brewing gloves for this because certainly that's going to be very very hot. Naturally before you start this process you need to pause the timer and you need to stop the pump. You're then going to stir the mash for, yeah, between two and five minutes I would say and then literally put everything back and resume the timer and switch the pump back on. And for this brew I will do this towards the end of every single mash step except for mash out. When utilising this technique coupled with the right grain crush and all of the other right techniques 
you can see your brew house efficiently go into the 90s. So as previously mentioned, we have four mash steps in this one, including mash out. And that is 30 minutes of 62 degrees C and 30 minutes of 67 degrees C and 20 minutes at 70 and then obviously our regular mash out. The end result of these mash steps will give you a much more complex beer and certainly something that's more interesting than a standard two-step mash. This variation in mash steps is very much in keeping with Belgian beer styles. So while I'm waiting for the mash, I'll start dealing with the boil additions. You can't see it here, but within the 15 minute edition, I've also added some yeast nutrient and I use this for every brew and I'd recommend that you do the same. You will note the absence of whirl flock, uh, protoflock or Irish moss, depending on what you want to call it, from this brew. The reason for its absence is actually twofold. Firstly, this will be a very dark beer, so clarity isn't really an issue. And then secondly, this will actually be conditioned in a carboy for an extended amount of time. So really, by the time this is bottled, it would have had plenty of time for everything to drop out and be clear. The two carboys that you can see in the video now are actually both going to be used with this brew. So the first one, the largest one of the two, that will be used for the fermentation process. The second one, that will be purely used for the conditioning. I have covered in a previous video on my channel the process of conditioning strong beers and then bottling onwards. Uh, but I'll go through a little bit of uh, some of that information here because it just feels so relevant. When we look to condition strong beers, and when I say strong, I'm talking 10% plus, then really the best and most efficient way to do that is in bulk. So we use carboys like these for that process. Your fermentation vessel can be any shape or size, it really doesn't matter. I am just happen to be using a carboy for this one as well. At the end of that fermentation process, and you've hit your final gravity and all is good, you then transfer to a carboy and fill it right up to the neck where I'm showing you here. As long as you do this, you will prevent oxidization. I have stored beer in this way for two years plus in the past without any issue at all. So have some confidence. So you might be wondering right now how long I would recommend that you store your beer. Well, patience will certainly be a virtue. I will actually store this one for 8 to 12 months as a minimum. And yes, I'm actually totally serious. And if you do the same, store it for that level of time, you will certainly understand and then recommend for other people to do the same with their strong beers. The end result is just far, far, far superior. If you do this extended storage in a carboy, which I would certainly recommend, then you'll get a far better result. Generally speaking, most of my batches that I long-term store, I end up having to bottle a little bit of it as well as put it into carboy. And the carboy stored versions are always superior to the bottle stored versions. So that's certainly enough for me. So back to the brew now and it's time to prepare our grains of paradise. Certainly I would recommend that you be very precise with the measurement of these. Um, too much or too little will certainly affect the brew. These will need to be crushed before you put them into your boil and I'd recommend wrapping them in a plastic bag as you can see me doing here before you start crushing. These things can get everywhere and we want them nowhere else but our boil. Once crushed I then add them to my 10 minute container for boil additions. Now I know that in every video I have the same message about sparging but this is me doing what I consider to be a fast sparge. Why did I not do it in my usual super slow fashion? Because I'd already reached a very nice level of gravity when I took a reading. So yeah, no problem at all. So we're now at the boil and look at the head on this one. Isn't she beautiful? I've actually zoomed in on this one on purpose just to show you the full beauty of this wall in close up. 
So what I'm doing now is I'm literally skimming the head and I'm wanting all of this foam, which is protein, to drop down. And I'm going to do this until I have a clear uh, head on top. And then I will start the boil timer and I will add in my first top addition. So with that now done, it's time to add our first top addition. It was like my jar didn't want to let go of it. With those all in now, I'll give this a nice stir. Apologies for the cloudiness of this footage, but things are getting pretty steamy in my brewing room. Okay, so it's now time to start the one hour timer for the boil. During the boil, your wort will need constant attention. It's important to make sure that the, when protein collects up on top, that you can see here, that you give it a good stir in. The other thing that's important to do, and I would suggest doing this every 20 to 30 minutes during your boil, is good to give the bottom a, a good scrape like you can see me doing here. By doing this you will stop any excessive build up on the bottom plate. Almost 20% of the grain bill of this brew is candy sugar based. So the purpose of this is uh, really two part. Firstly it will give some nice dark fruit flavours and secondly it will give that extra alcohol but without actually adding more to the body and that's really what these dark Belgian brews are all about. To make up the amount that I need for the boil I'm using syrup and also some crystals as well. I've also got a third bottle of syrup that will be added during fermentation and the idea there is that that will actually get the flavours through further into the beer. So I've now added boiling wort to these candy uh, sugar crystals and the idea being is that I'm going to give them a nice stir up and hope that they'll melt down as much as possible before I add them to my grain father. I'm now adding the candy syrup to the same mix so that I can pitch all of this in one go. So here goes that. Now what I'd suggest is when you actually add anything like this, of course with syrup it's not a problem, but when you're adding sugar, um, particularly this candy grain stuff, then make sure that you break it up as small as possible in the start, but when you add it, add it to a particular section of your grain father so that you can actually scrape down below on the bottom and make sure all of this doesn't stick. This is a very important point. Once you feel like you've dealt with all of that, give it a nice good stir. Before the end of the boil, what I do is I hook up the counterflow chiller as you can see here. The reason for this is actually twofold. Firstly, I want to sterilise my counterflow chiller with the boiling hot wort. And secondly, I want to make sure that I'm able to whirlpool at zero minutes and then use that as part of the cooling process before I even engage the cold water into the counterflow chiller. I whirlpool for about five minutes and then I let it sit for about five minutes. And then I start the cooling process. This wall pooling allows all of the gunk at the bottom to go into a nice tidy cone in the middle of the system and thus taking it away from the pump as well, stopping any potential pump blockages. One quick, easy and cheap modification that I would certainly recommend to everyone is that you add a small circlip to the filter, as you can see in this uh, photograph here. I've actually been rather lucky in terms of the filter, I've actually only ever knocked it off once. But even so, considering the price and the ease of this mod, I think it's worth doing. I did a fair amount of testing with this before I decided that this was the way to do it. The testing that I did was basically adding water to the grain father and giving it vigorous stirs. Every time that I managed to knock it off, it came off with the rubber included. So, hence why I've actually secured it at this end. There's no inconvenience to this, it's easy to take on and off as well. Right, so let's get back to this brew. So, it's now time to take all of our wort and put it into our carboy ready for fermentation. And you can see that I've rigged up my usual setup here, uh, which basically allows some uh, extra air to go into my wort which will help the yeast give a nice good fermentation start. For some reason I collected more wort than I actually planned for here. 
Um, I've actually got about 18 litres here and I was aiming for 15 but luckily because of the uh, efficiency measures that I took I wasn't far off and um, yeah when you're talking about a small difference in a beer like this it's not really going to have any real effect. Within a very very short time this was actually the scene and you can see that we have a fermentation process that has now started with a nice crawzen on the top. A bit later on and things were going totally mental down here. This M31 uh, mangrove jack yeast is absolutely insane. The M31 is certainly my preference when it comes to these styles of beers and the reasons for that are actually more than just how quickly it starts. It's also an extremely fast finisher as well. One thing I have found though, and I have mentioned this when I've used it previously and made a video of it, is that it tends to always go down much further in terms of its attenuation rate quoted. So in past brews I've had it go down to almost 1000, just over 1000 in terms of gravity. Um, so you know th this is something to be aware of because certainly you're going to get more alcohol when you use this yeast than perhaps you will pre-plan. So certainly this is something to be aware of, and once you are aware of it, you can exploit it to its fullest. And that's exactly what I'm doing here. <laughs> once you have seen five days of fermentation, then I would recommend that you add the extra amount of candy sugar that's in the recipe. And what this will basically do is allow those flavours to come through the beer far, far clearer than they would otherwise. Okay, so there you have it. That's the end of that one. I hope you all enjoyed it and found it interesting and useful. So if you did like this video, then please do go ahead and like it on YouTube. This really helps me out and allows the videos to be seen by a wider audience on YouTube. I've got a lot of videos in the pipeline for the future, so if you're interested in uh, seeing what I've got coming up, then please subscribe for future content. If you have any questions on anything that I've covered in this video or in others or anything to do with brewing in general, then please do not hesitate to get in touch. I'm more than happy to help. Until then, happy brewing!